Hi guys, I'm Abhinav. A lot has been said and a lot has been talked about ever since two instances came out about the Himalayan 450 chassis breaking. Um, naturally, it is a cause of concern and I was also extremely curious about it. I had a very, very, very long and elaborate chat with the folks at Royal Enfield, some very senior technical people and they helped me understand a little bit of why what happened and um, what can be done to maybe prevent it. Now, to understand all of that, we will first have to understand a little bit about how this motorcycle's engine and chassis is constructed. If the camera comes close, I want to show a few things to you. If you take a look at the Royal Enfield frame, this is a steel tubular frame, but in the steel tubular frame, the engine is a stress member of the frame. So all the load that is distributed, all the load that the engine makes, the power that the engine makes, everything, it gets transferred to the frame with the help of the engine. It is not a full cradle frame. Um, the down tube, there is this tube, this black one that goes up to the neck of the frame. And then there is this top tube that comes down and then, you know, the subframe is mounted on it and then the uh, swig arm is mounted on it. The engine is mounted on it predominantly using these two points. If you see here, if the camera comes very close, do you see this? So the bolt goes through here. There is a casting in the cylinder head uh, in this upper block uh, of the cylinder. So there is a casting over here in which the bolt goes. And then if you see this uh, plate with the three bolts here, uh, two are mounted to the frame and one is mounted to the engine at the back over here. Again, so all of this forms one particular unit. The engine in this configuration is called a stressed member of the entire chassis package. Now, how is a package like this assembled? Royal Enfield told me, the when, if the camera again comes close, the tolerances when an engine is made, because you know, these are parts that are cast. So when these are made, these are very high tolerance parts. So the chances of any deviation in, uh, you know, like a couple of mm of deviation when these are made are extremely low because these parts are cast. So then first an engine is being put on, uh, you know, the assembly table. Then the frame is brought and put on top of it. From the left hand side, let's say, they will first clamp the bolt on the engine. Okay, in this, let's say this particular bolt and at the back. Then what they do is because uh, steel tubular chassis, the tolerances will never be the same as the engine. It'll still, the, toler uh, the tolerance here will still be very close, but then the chances of tolerance of this is higher. So how do they ensure that it fits correctly every single time? What they do is they have a little piece over here that goes inside. Okay, it's like a load adjuster. And when the bolt goes in, that thing expands. So it's like the bolt going into that thing, it expanding and finding its own place over there. And then this is tightened and then to a certain uh, torque spec. And you know, then the engine sits properly. That is how these motorcycles are sent out from the factory. There's a certain piece that goes inside, the bolt goes inside that, it finds its place and it is tightened to a certain torque. That is how the engine is assembled to the frame and then uh, being a stress member, it's designed in a certain way that, you know, the load will be distributed evenly. There is no chance of a breakage. Now, what happens if you want to fit an accessory onto your motorcycle, like an engine guard or a crash guard or a leg guard, whatever you want to call it. Now, again, if the camera comes close, Royal Enfield sells two types of crash guards. This is the rally style of crash guard, which is mounted one at the bottom and one over here. So they take the mounting from the down tube. And if you, if you, if the camera goes here, if you see this, so this is the frame, this is the crash guard. There is a bush inside. There's a metal spacer inside, which actually acts as a load distribution or a load carrying unit. So when the bolt goes in, it's tightened to a certain uh, torque specification. 
the load is distributed. This helps in taking the load. And again, it's designed in a certain way that all that load will be distributed equally and the chances of a chassis snapping are absolutely non-existent. The way the stock thing has been designed, the OEM part has been designed. Now, what could have happened when those two chassis snapped? The first incident, it surfaced mid-May. It was from a SAM. The person was using an aftermarket uh, crash guard. The second instance, the second incident, it was reported from a rider who was riding from Chennai to Hyderabad and en route the chassis snapped. In both these cases, the motorcycle had an aftermarket crash guard on it. Now, is the aftermarket crash guard to blame or uh, the incorrect installation of the aftermarket crash guard to blame? Let's try and, you know, uh, dive a little deep into that. Now, if the camera again comes close, the way most aftermarket crash guards are made, most of them don't factor in the spacer. There's a certain, uh, uh, you know, this, this uh, circular thing, this will come and directly attach to the chassis itself. There'll be a separate bolt that's given, uh, maybe a shorter bolt because it's not accounting for the spacer, and it'll be tightened into the cylinder head, the mounting in the cylinder head. Now, when that is tightened, again, the way this has been originally designed, it gets compromised because nobody, let's be very real if the camera points towards me, nobody in India, when you're fitting this in your local garage, nobody has a torque wrench. They don't torque bolts down to spec. And, uh, you know, it's a very chalta hai sort of attitude where you'll say, Acha, let's tighten it to the max that is possible, just enough that the thread does not slip, the bolt does not slip, and it's okay, it's done. Now, that's not a very good idea because suddenly now you've eliminated what Royal Enfield thought of, this spacer to distribute the load equally. Now, let's say if this bolt, it is left a little loose or if it comes loose. Now, what happens is the down tube is not taking the right amount of load that the engine should have supported and that load is now being transferred up the down tube and onto the top tube. Royal Enfield ran a long simulation. If the camera again comes close and stays somewhere in this region, um, Royal Enfield ran a long simulation where they realized if this bolt is not tightened, A, the other side bolt also should come loose. If it doesn't, if it's not tightened, what eventually will happen is, let's say the bolt is tightened and you run a simulation of how this motorcycle runs in a fatigue test. A fatigue test is where, you know, a motorcycle with full load is put on a machine on rollers and it's going up and down, up and down a certain number of kilometers. When that happens, they showed me a graph where, you know, the tolerance, where the load is like this, a single line. If this is left loose, now the amount of load that is onto the top tube, it increased 10 times. The graph showed a big, huge uh, wave, you know. And then there are two hot spots that they identified. One somewhere over here on the top tube. Now visualize, let's say the tank is not there and this top tube is going up all the way here to the neck. And this other hot spot is over here. One here, one here. So after a some certain number of kilometers, the simulation showed that fatigue builds up and the chassis can crack if the engine is not distributing the load properly throughout the frame. Now that is very, very, very concerning because we use an aftermarket crash guard. Now I'm not saying all aftermarket crash guards are bad. However, Royal Enfield has designed their crash guards and the motorcycle a certain way. The motorcycles have been heavily tested and we've now seen two failures using aftermarket crash guards. I want to tell you something, you know, uh, there are almost 40,000 Himalayan 450s that are out there in the market right now. Of those 40,000 Himalayan 450s, we've seen this chassis uh, breakage incident in two motorcycles. Uh, if the camera points at me. I asked Royal Enfield, how much did you test this motorcycle before it was put into production form and sold in the market? They told me cumulatively of all the test mules that they ran, they tested the motorcycle for a million kilometers. 
Now, they never, they never experienced a situation like this because they never ran aftermarket crash guards, right? So they had company-fitted crash guards and something like this never happened. Now, the question here is, should you be worried if you have aftermarket crash guards on your motorcycle and how do we combat it? We've, we've learned how the engine is mounted to the frame, what can cause the chassis breakage, in what caused the chassis breakage in those two incidents. And by the way, Royal Enfield, they honored warranty on those both those motorcycles and they replaced the cylinder head and the frame on the bikes. Those bikes are running fine right now. Now, what can you do? Now, if you're worried, this is a solution that Royal Enfield has not given me. This is something that I can think of. A, I feel on a motorcycle like this, it's just better if you run OEM crash bars the OEM crash bar, the leg guard kind of thing that Royal Enfield sells, it's for 4,700 4, rupees or 4,750 rupees, 5,000 rupees, let's say. The aftermarket crash guards that you people uh, buy, they range somewhere between 5,000 to 6,000, 7,000 or so. So it's not like, you know, you're getting a lot more protection or you're saving a lot more money. In a way, you might just be putting your motorcycle at risk. So... If you haven't put any crash guards on your motorcycle so far, and if you're looking to buy new crash guards, in my opinion, this is my opinion and my opinion only, let me please tell you that, I would recommend go for the Royal Enfield crash guards. This is a particular, uh, this is the second type of crash guard that they sell, which is a rally crash guard. It comes with an aluminium bash plate and a little bit of engine protection. This one sells for a little bit more, 10,000 rupees, but that is understandable because it has a full aluminium bash plate as well. So it's not even like you're saving a hell lot of money, 10,000 rupees versus 6, 7,000 rupees uh, in getting decent protection because there's a bash plate here as well. So point number one, if you can get OEM. Point number two, if you have aftermarket crash guards on your motorcycle, in my opinion, I think what you should do is just go to the service center, get your motorcycle inspected, let them at least talk those bolt down to a certain specification that the motorcycle comes with. Maybe the service advisor there would be able to guide you, but uh, the best possible foolproof solution in, again, in my opinion, is to run factory OEM products. Now, also remember this, and this is something that Royal Enfield told me. Uh, they told me that the tolerances of the crash guard, the quality control that they put in while making a crash guard, it is as intensive as the entire motorcycle itself. So their accessories also go through a certain process of development, a certain process of quality control. And uh, I'm sure you also understand that, that aftermarket will not be able to provide you that same level of quality that an OEM would. I want to make a couple of more points. Royal Enfield told me that, you know, um, even the bolt that they use, even if uh, you put in aftermarket bolts, even a grade can change the load. Even that makes a difference. That is what they told me. So it's just better to stick to OEM in this case, as far as I understand. Then a lot of aftermarket crash guards that I see, uh, what they do is they just put in a lot of metal and they've taken metal and uh, chosen, chosen mounting points, which can be a little questionable. So I've seen mounting where a crash guard is going and mounting onto the subframe point. Now, this is something that I've never seen on any international product, never in my life. I don't think that's a very wise idea to use the subframe uh, mounting point either. But that is, again, my opinion, not Royal Enfield's. Let's take a look here. If you see the upper crash bars on the Royal Enfield Himalayan, here, if you see here, the same principle is used, where there is a metal piece that protrudes and then the main thing is mounted on top of it. The whole idea of a crash bar is that when the motorcycle falls, it takes the impact. It may be bends from these points, but it shouldn't transfer all of that impact onto your chassis. If this point, if this metal bracket is not there and the bar is directly mounted on top of that, uh, you know, engine mount or whatever mount, the forces will get transferred to that mount. You can end up damaging your chassis. In this case, uh, all that will happen is you'll end up bending the crash bars, but not your frame. So, you know, there's a certain level of engineering that is involved in this. Uh, I, I, I've just figured that 
maybe using OEM is the best solution in this case. Mm, that's 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 pretty much it, guys. You know, um, don't think of this video as me siding with Royal Enfield and me trying to promote their OEM parts. I just wanted to understand from them what is the most logical explanation for the two chassis breaking and how it can be prevented so that you, the audience, me, the rider, we guys can make the right informed choice and, you know, prevent any such issue in our motorcycles because nobody wants to be stranded in the middle of a road on a ride with a broken chassis. Um, I wouldn't put the motorcycle's engineering at fault over here. It's a very capable motorcycle. Um, and I think I've told you enough and you are now informed enough to make the choice for yourself whether you want to stick to OEM or whether you want to risk it with an aftermarket crash guard. Um, yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. If you have any questions, let me know. I had a very, very long detailed chat with Royal Enfield and maybe in this one impromptu video, I might not have been able to cover all aspects of it. Put your questions and your doubts in the video. I will try and answer it. Maybe I'll even speak to Royal Enfield again. I'll run those questions by them and I'll try and get you answers for those questions. Um, and yeah, that's it. That's it from my end. Uh, we have to head back to Delhi now. I'm going to enjoy my ride. It's a very hot day. I'm wearing a cooling vest. I'm going to just put on my jacket and leave. Uh, thank you. Thank you for watching, guys. Bye-bye. Have a nice day.